Can I give reference? According to St. Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, verse number 14, and if Christ has not risen from the dead, our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. As the pastor said, that all your good deeds, all your charity, without believing in Christ died for the sin, it is useless. And the Christian missionaries, the reference they didn't give, quoting from Isaiah, chapter number 64, verse number 6, that all our righteousness, all our good deeds are like filthy rags. If you don't believe Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, died on the cross for the sin of humanity, all your righteousness, all your good deeds are like filthy rags. And in the words of the pastor, which I wouldn't ever say, he says, if there is no cross, if there is no crucifixion, Bible is less than two pies. And he says, if no crucifixion, there's no Christianity. And I agree with him. And I agree with him. And the pastor said that he came to India and he spent more than two decades here. And only when he came to India, he really realized the message of Christianity. Previously, he was only a Christian, but he became a practicing Christian from the Muslims here. I would like to remind him that I have only met one Arab Christian before in my life, before meeting pastor. One Arab Christian I met in Jeddah from Syria. And after he attended my talk, Alhamdulillah, by Allah's grace, he accepted Islam. This is the second time in my life that personally I'm meeting an Arab Christian. And inshallah, with Allah's help, and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him hidayah, that since he got the teachings of Christianity from the Indians, he will come back to the original faith, which is Islam, which every human being is born in. Inshallah, after this talk, after having discussion, inshallah, I pray that he comes back to the original faith, inshallah, realizing that there's no crucifixion, no cross, no Christianity. <laughs> which inshallah I will do in the course of my time. Let's see what St. Paul has to say regarding resurrection. St. Paul, he comments on resurrected bodies. In the same chapter where he says, if Christ hasn't risen, our faith is in vain, our preaching is in vain. Same chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, towards the end of the chapter. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 42 to 44, he says that so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. According to St. Paul, the resurrected bodies are spiritualized. They are spiritualized. Same is said by his Lord and Master, Jesus, peace be upon him, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 20, verse number 27 to 36. If you remember the story of a woman who had seven husbands, and the Jews come with a poser to Jesus, peace be upon him, and it's a Jewish practice that if a man marries a woman, and if he dies without leaving any children, the second brother marries the wife of the diseased brother so that he can give her his seed. If the second brother dies without leaving any children, the third brother marries, so on and so forth. So here they come with a poser that this woman married seven brothers one after the other. And all of them had her here means they had her as a wife here, one after the other. But there was no problem, why? Since each one of them had turned by turn, so there was no problem. And later on, even she dies. But they pose the question to Jesus, peace be upon him, that in resurrection, who will have her there? Indicating, during resurrection, all the seven brothers will be raised simultaneously, along with the woman, who will have her there? So Jesus, peace be upon him, says, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 20, verse 35 and 36, that resurrected bodies, they do not marry. Neither do they give in marriage. Verse 36 says that neither shall they die anymore. They are equal unto the angels. That means they shall be angelized. Resurrected body will be spiritualized. Who says that? Jesus says that. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 20, verse 36. Paul says that. 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verse number 42 to 44. It's very clear. And 
there's not a single verse anywhere in the gospel which says that Jesus, peace be upon him, was resurrected. In fact, if you read, it's mentioned. If you remember the story that after the alleged crucifixion, when the disciples, they met in the upper room, Jesus, peace be upon him, he comes. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 24, verse number 36. He comes and he says to the disciple, Shalom, in Hebrew, which means peace unto you. Next verse, Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verse 37, says, But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed him to be a spirit. I'm asking a question. Why did the disciples think Jesus, peace be upon him, to be a spirit? Did Jesus look like a spirit? And when I asked this question to the Christians, all of them said no. And they are right. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did not look like a spirit when he comes to the upper room after the Alice crucifixion. So why did they think that he was a spirit? The reason is because they had heard from hearsay that the master Jesus, peace be upon him, was put on the cross. They had learned from hearsay that he had given up the ghost, that he had died. They had learned from hearsay that he was dead and buried in the grave for three days. Hearsay, hearsay. You know why? Because they were not eyewitnesses. According to Mark, Gospel of Mark, chapter number 14, verse number 50, it says that all of them forsook him and fled. In the most crucial juncture, in the life of Jesus, peace be upon him, when he required them the most, all the disciples, 100%, all of them, according to Mark, chapter 14, verse 50, they forsook him and fled. Who says that? Not Dr. Zakir Naik. Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verse number 50. All of them forsook him. So it was from hearsay. Therefore, they think and they thought that he was a spirit. But Jesus, peace be upon him, to clarify that out, it's mentioned in the next two verses. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 24, verse number 39 and 40, Jesus, peace be upon him, says, that, behold, my hands and feet. It is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit has no flesh and bone, as you see me have. And saying so, he shows them his hands and feet. He tells them, behold, my hands and feet. It is I myself. What has happened to you? It is me, your Lord and Master Jesus, peace be upon him. Why are you frightened? Handle me and see. Behold, my hands and feet, for a spirit has no flesh and bones. What was he trying to prove by showing his hands and feet? Was he trying to prove that he was resurrected? Was he trying to prove that he was spirit? He was trying to prove that he was not a spirit. He was not resurrected. Next two verses. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 24, verse number 41 to 42. It says that they were overjoyed and they wondered. They thought he's dead and now they're happy that the Lord and Master is alive, physical, with flesh and bones in front of them. They are happy. Jesus, peace be upon him, yet to confirm them, says that, do you have any meat here? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and an honeycomb. And he took it and he ate before them. To prove what? That he was resurrected? To prove that he was spirit? To prove that he was a physical body? He ate and he chewed in front of them. A piece of broiled fish and honeycomb to prove that he was not resurrected, he was not a spirit, but he was in flesh and bones, a physical body. If no resurrection, no crucifixion, no Christianity. If you remember the story of Mary Magdalene, when she goes to the tomb of Jesus, peace be upon him on the third day, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 20, verse number one as well as the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 16, verse number 2, that it was the first day of the week, meaning it was a Sunday. Sabbath day is Saturday for the Jews. The first day of the week is Sunday. It was the first day of the week that Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb. Now, why should Mary Magdalene go to the tomb on the third day after Jesus Christ, peace be upon, supposedly was dead? Why should she go? The reply is given in the verse earlier, in the Gospel of Mark, Chapter number 16, verse number 1. That Mary Magdalene goes to massage Jesus, peace be upon him, to anoint him. The word is anoint, which the original Hebrew word is masaha, means to massage, to rub, to anoint. 
And from this root word, you can even derive the Arabic word, Masih, or the Hebrew word, Messiah, which means the anointed one, which if you translate to Greek, it means Christos, from which you get the word Christ, the anointed one. I'm asking a question. Do Jews massage dead bodies on the third day? Have you any time heard Jews massaging dead bodies on the third day? And the answer is no. I'm asking the Christians. Do Christians massage dead bodies on the third day? And the answer is no. Do Muslims? Do we massage dead bodies on the third day? And the answer is no. So why is she going to the tomb to massage Jesus who has died on the third day according to the Christians? You know why? Because she was the only one besides Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus who gave the burial bath to Jesus' peace be upon him. And when Jesus' body was brought down, peace be upon him, from the cross, she might have seen some life in the limb body. But naturally, she is not going to say, he's alive! Otherwise, they will put him to death again. Seeing certain life in the limb body of Jesus' peace be upon him, she comes back on the third day after the Sabbath day to look for a live Jesus peace be upon him. A live Jesus peace be upon him. And it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 20, verse number 1, and the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 16, verse number 4, that she finds that the stone has been removed. And even the winding sheets, they are unwound and placed in a pile. The question is, why should the stone be removed? And why should the winding sheets be unwound and placed at the side, piled up at the side? If Jesus, peace be upon, was resurrected as a spiritual body, does a spirit require the stone of the entry of the tomb to be removed? If it's a spirit, those cannot stop a spirit from entering. The stone need not be removed. Why was the stone removed? And if a spirit has to move, does it have to unwound the winding sheets? It's not required. But if it's a physical body, the stone blocking the entry of the tomb has to be removed. The winding sheets have to be unwound, proving that Jesus' peace be upon him, the person who came out of the tomb, was a physical body. And the tomb was a private property of the secret disciple of Joseph of Arimathea, who was a rich and influential Jew. And he had carved a big roomy tomb, maybe for himself, for future, in which Jesus' peace be upon him was kept. The tomb or the sepulchre. And according to Jim Bishop, he says, Jim Bishop, not Bible, Jim Bishop, says it was very roomy, very big. Five feet wide, seven feet in height, and 15 feet in depth. Why do you require a roomy tomb? So that if anyone wants to help a person, it can be done easily. These are small rooms in Bombay. It is approximately 75 square feet. 75 square feet flat is big in Bombay. We find five, six people living in that room in Bombay, one of the most expensive places in the world. 75 square feet, you find four, five people living in it. So roomy enough if they want to help the person. Why would they want to help a spiritual body? A spiritual body is only going to help. But naturally, they want to help a physical body. Further, if you read in the Gospel of John, chapter number 20, Verse number 15, Jesus, he sees that Mary Magdalene from the earth, from terra firma, not from the heaven, he sees her and she's weeping. And he comes to her and asks, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Knowing very well what is the reason, but yet asking her. She says, and supposed him to be a gardener. She asks him, where have you taken him? and laid him so that I may take him away. I'm asking a question. Why did Mary Magdalene suppose Jesus to be, peace be upon him, a gardener? I'm asking a question. Do resurrected bodies look like gardeners? Do they? Yes or no? No. So why should she suppose that Jesus, peace be upon him, was a gardener? And the answer is because he was disguised as a gardener. Now, why should a spiritual body be disguised as a gardener? Jesus Christ was disguised as a gardener, peace be upon him, because he was afraid of the Jews. A spiritual body need not be afraid of the Jews. Why? Because according to Hebrew, 
chapter number 9, verse 27. A man dies only once. And after that is the day of judgment. Jesus, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 20, verse number 36, neither shall you die anymore. Because if you're spiritualized, you don't have to be afraid of anyone. No one can harm you. You cannot die a second time. If he's spiritualized, why should he be disguised? Why should he be afraid? Why should he be in hiding? Why should he run away from the Jews? Proving that he was not a spiritual body, but he was alive. And he says to Mary, Mary, the one word is sufficient for Mary to recognize her Lord and Master. You know, because everyone has a particular style of calling the beloved one. And the tone in the style which you call the beloved one is sufficient to recognize who is the person. She immediately recognizes that it is Jesus peace be upon him. And she rushes forward toward him. Gospel of John, chapter number 20, verse 15, 16, 17. Jesus peace be upon him says, touch me not. Why? Why touch me not? Is he a bundle of electricity that if someone touches him, the person will be electrocuted? Is he a bundle of dynamite that if someone touches, they will blow up? Why does he say, touch me not? Because he was a physical body. Imagine the ordeal, the pain, the physical pain, the emotional pressure that he had going through all that so-called, supposedly put on the cross, put on the cross, all that pain and torture, it will hurt a physical body. He says, touch me not. And then continues and says, in Gospel of John chapter 20, verse number 17, I have not yet ascended unto my father. <laughs> Meaning what? That he has not yet been dead. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, unequivocally says that he has not yet been resurrected. Proving that he was alive. Later on it's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 16, verse number 11, that the disciples, they had heard that Jesus, peace be upon him, was alive. From her, Mary Magdalene, but they believed not. You know, the Jews, they had a habit of posing questions, troubling the messengers. The Quran says that, the Bible says that, they posed questions to Moses, peace be upon him, they troubled him, and they harassed him, same they did with Jesus, peace be upon him. Further, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 38. The Jews come up to Jesus, peace be upon him, and say, Master, Rabbi, meaning, O oh Lord, why don't you give us a sign? Sign meaning a miracle. Miracle. All the good works that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did was not sufficient to convince the Jews. They said, give us a sign, give us a miracle. Maybe, like flying in the air, like walking on the water, like walking on burning charcoal. They wanted some miracle. Sign here doesn't mean a sign on a lamppost. You know? Like you have signs on the roads. It's not that sign. It particularly means a miracle. And if you read the New International Version, it says a miraculous sign. What is the reply Jesus, peace be upon him, gives? What is the reply he gives? In the next verse, Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 39 and 40 says, you evil and adulterous generation, seek it be after a sign? You seek for a miracle? No sign shall be given to you but the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus, peace be upon him, doesn't say that, see, go and meet Bartimaeus, the blind person who I gave sight. Why don't you ask the woman with issues, who only on touching me she was healed? He didn't refer to the 2,000 pigs he had killed to heal a possessed man. He doesn't say that the 5,000 and the 3,000 people he fed with a broiled fish and with bread. He says, no sign shall be given to you but the sign of Jonah. Jesus, peace be upon him, is putting all his eggs in one basket. The sign of Jonah. And for a person to know the sign of Jonah, he doesn't have to be a scholar of the Bible. He doesn't have to be a doctor of divinity because it is taught in Sunday schools. And in most countries, including India, irrespective whether you're a Christian, or a Muslim, or a Hindu, somewhere or the other it is taught, either in comics, or 
in moral science lessons, the sign of Jonah or Jonah and the whale. They know. But if you want to know the sign of Jonah actually in the Bible, in this big book, the sign of Jonah is less than two pages, less than one and a half page. I had the Zerox copy done from the same Bible to make it easy. Less than one and a half side. Less than one and a half side. Only four chapters. And to find one page in encyclopedia of more than a thousand pages is difficult. But everyone knows the outline of the story. That Almighty God, he asks his messenger, Jonah, peace be upon him, to go and deliver the message to the Ninevites, to go to Nineveh. But he says, these Ninevites, they are so sinful. What will they listen to the message? He thinks that they will make fun of me. It will be a waste of time. So he goes to Joppa, and from there, he's setting sail to Tarshish. Now, while he's at sea, there's a huge storm. And it was the superstition of the Marines of that time that if there's a storm at sea, it is because someone has disobeyed the master. And they had their own ways in trying to find who was the person responsible. They had the system of casting of lots. And when they cast lots, it comes to the turn of Jonah, peace be upon him. And Jonah, being a messenger of Almighty God, he agrees and he says that, see, I am the person responsible. I was told by my master, Lord, to go to Nineveh, but from Joppa, I am setting sail to Tarshish, running away. I am at fault. You take me and throw me overboard. But they say, this person, such a pious person, why should simply he be killed? So they try and stir the ship, but yet they are not successful. The storm is yet there. So he says that, why don't you throw me overboard? And finally they agree, and they throw him overboard. When they throw him overboard, the storm subsides. Maybe it was a coincidence. Later on, a big fish, a whale comes and swallows Jonah, peace be upon him. Jonah prays to Almighty God from the belly of the whale. The whale takes Jonah, peace be upon him, for three days and three nights around the ocean, and then vomits him out on the seashore. What is the sign of Jonah, Jesus, peace be upon him, says? That no sign shall be given to you but the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now I'd like to ask you a question. When Jonah was thrown overboard, was he dead or alive? Before you answer, I would like to make it easy for you. Let's see, Jonah volunteers. He says, I'm the culprit, I'm responsible, throw me overboard. If someone doesn't agree, maybe you'll have to break his leg, you may have to break his, his neck, you may have to twist his arm, but here he volunteers, so they don't have to do all that. So they throw him overboard. I'm asking you a question, when Jonah was thrown overboard, was he dead or was he alive? Alive. The fish comes and follows him. Was he dead or alive? alive? Alive. He prays to Almighty God from the belly of the whale. Was he dead or alive? Do dead men pray? Was he dead or alive? Alive. alive. The whale takes Jonah three days and three nights in the ocean. Dead or alive? Alive. alive. Fish vomits him out on the seashore. Was he dead or alive? Alive. Alive, 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 alive. When a person is thrown overboard in a raging sea, he ought to die. If he dies, no miracle. If he's alive, it's a miracle. Fish comes and follows him. He ought to die. He doesn't die. It's a miracle. Three days and three nights, suffocation and heat, in the belly of the whale, he ought to die. He doesn't die. It's a miracle. It's a miracle of a miracle of a miracle. Miracle of a miracle of a miracle. Jesus said, peace be upon him, as Jonah was three days and three nights, so shall the son of man be three days and three nights. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jonah was alive. But when I pose the question to my Christian brothers, and they are our brothers, they are our cousins, what do you call? They are brothers. When I pose the question to the Christians, that how was Jesus peace be upon him in the tomb according to you? And all of them say, that he was dead. He was dead. I'm asking a question. Jonah was alive. Jesus, peace be upon him, was dead. So was Jesus, peace be upon him, alike 
or unlike Jonah? Like or unlike? Unlike. So Jesus, peace be upon him, does not fulfill the prophecy. He puts all his eggs in one basket and says no sign shall be given but the sign of Jonah. And here the prophecy is not fulfilled. For the prophecy to be fulfilled, he should be alive. As I proved in the earlier part of my talk, he was alive. Otherwise, Jesus, peace be upon him, will be a liar. Nausbillah, which we cannot agree. We respect him, we revere him. So for him to fulfill the prophecy, he should be alive. And Jesus, peace be upon him, was alive as I proved in the earlier part of my talk. As I said, that for a person to be crucified, he should be put to death on the cross. If he does not die on the cross, he is not crucified. There are some people who may say, let's see here the main part of the sign is not dead or alive, it's a time factor, time factor. You know, three days and three nights, as Jonah was in the valley of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights. Three is mentioned four times. The main important emphasis is three, three, three. It is not dead or alive. I say, what is so unique about three? If I say, I took three days and three nights to reach Delhi, is it a miracle? What is so miracle about three? Three days or three weeks? It's not a miracle. But they say, no, it is a time factor. Let's analyze whether Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, fulfills the time factor which the Christians, some Christians say, is the main theme of the sign. As I said earlier, and we know that when we ask the Christian that when was Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, crucified, and according to the Bible, the Christians will say, on a good Friday. So we ask him, what is so good about the Friday? They say, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, died for our sins. Therefore, it's a good Friday. And if you read that it was, the trial was in a hurry, they were hurry for the trial, they were in a hurry to put him up on the cross, they were hurry to get him down, because as pastor said, no one can stay overnight hanging on the cross on the Sabbath, according to, he didn't mention the reference, Deuteronomy chapter number 21, verse number 23. The land will get cursed. So they were hurry to get him down. And they give the burial bath, and it is by the time late in the evening. He's put in the sepulcher late in the evening. And according to the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 1, it was the first day of the week, Sunday morning, that the tomb was found empty by Mary Magdalene. So supposedly, Jesus was in the tomb on Friday night. Why do I say supposedly? Because the Bible does not say, when does Jesus leave the tomb? Maybe he left on Friday late night or Saturday morning. It doesn't say, agreeing that latest he might have left is in early morning on Sunday. So Jesus was in the tomb Friday night. Supposedly, he was there in the tomb Saturday day. Supposedly, he was there in the tomb Saturday night. Supposedly, Sunday morning, the tomb is empty. So he was there for two nights and one day. But the sign says three days and three nights. Three days and three nights. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Three days and three nights. But Jesus, peace be upon him, was actually one day and two nights. Is three days and three nights equal to one day and two nights? Is it equal? Three days and three nights equal? No. So even the time factor which they boast about is not fulfilled. The real thing is, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was alive. For a person to be crucified, he should die on the cross. Just to make easy for the pastor in the rebuttal time he has, I list the major points proving that he was not crucified, he was not resurrected, because he was alive. If he's alive, no crucifixion, no resurrection. He was put on the cross and brought down very fast in three hours. In three hours, it's difficult for a person to die. Therefore, Jesus was alive. When he's brought down, even his two crossmates, they are alive, proving that even Jesus was alive. Point number two. Point number three, his legs were not broken. What use is a broken leg to a dead man? Proving that he was alive. Point number four, that the stone was removed and the winding sheets were unbound, proving that Jesus, peace be upon him, was alive. Point number five, that he was disguised as a gardener. Why? Because he was alive, trying to be saved from the Jews. Point number six, the tomb was roomy. It was spacious. What use is a spacious tomb for a dead person, proving Jesus was alive? Point number seven, 
that when Mary Magdalene goes to touch Jesus, peace be upon him, he says, touch me not. Why? He was a physical body. He was alive. It will hurt him. He was in pain, proving that he was alive. Jesus, peace be upon him, says that I have not yet ascended unto my father. That means he was alive. Point number nine, Mary Magdalene, not afraid of recognizing Jesus, peace be upon him. Point number ten, that in the upper room, he shows his hands and feet to prove that he was not a spirit, but he was alive. Point number eleven, that they were overjoyed to see him. Why? Because they thought he's dead and the spirit form. They were overjoyed to see because he was alive. Point number twelve, he ate a piece of broiled fish and honeycomb to prove that he was alive. The disciples had heard from Mary Magdalene that he was alive. Point number 14, the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, alive, alive, alive. If he's alive, no crucifixion, no resurrection. So in short, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was put on the cross, according to the Bible, but he did not die. Now, the topic is, was Christ really crucified? If he's put on the cross and if he dies, he's crucified. If he's put on the cross and does not die, what is one word that we'll use? See, English language is deficient. If you look up in the dictionary for a word, for a person who's put on the cross but does not die, you will not find any word. So we have to coin new word. The best word that we can coin is that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not crucified, but he was crucifixed. It is not crucifixion, C-R-U-C-I-F-I-X-I-O-N, but it is crucifixion, C-R-U-C-I-F-I-C-T-I-O-N. It's a fiction. We have to coin a new word. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not crucifixed. He was crucifixed. So I hope this ends the friction and the pastor will agree and the confusion will be removed from his mind that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not crucified. There is no crucifixion, F-I-X-7, but crucifixion, F-I-C-T-I-O-N. I'd like to end my talk by giving the quotation of the glorious Quran from Surah Al Imran, chapter number three, verse number 54, which says, wa makaru wa makarallahu wallahu khairul makreen. They planned and plotted. Allah too planned. Allah is the best of planner. Wa akhru dawana, alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zakir, for your points. Uh, I saw a lot of illogical discussion. Some of the things missed the spirit of the word in many, many different ways. So badly went illogical. It's difficult to even uh, discuss it. I sleep and I rise. Does it mean I'm resurrected? Does it mean that? My purpose here is to present a solution for your life from sin, Jesus the crucified. That's my person, even if I lose the argument. Whatever gymnastics you try, even if you ask Einstein to help you, you can never prove from the Bible if he had believed, he would have had the poison. His faith has gone down, and I congratulate him. He's coming back to his original faith, that is Islam. Uh, uh, yeah, um, brother has asked a very complicated question. One day we'll go for a chai wala, we'll sit together and discuss it together. <laughs>